Hello and welcome to the 10th Cloudscape devlog. In this video, I'll talk about the changes and improvements I've made to the procedural terrain generation for the game, and I'll also briefly talk about developing a shader to allow grass and plants to sway in the wind and react to the player. Up until these changes, initially the cliffs and divots in the game were not traversable. Basically, the player couldn't walk around in the open cliff areas or in the divots. This meant originally the cliffs and divots were purely cosmetic, which was never really my intention. So the first step was to make those open areas in the cliffs and divots traversable. This was kind of trickier than it first appears, mainly because the way I'm handling the collision for cliffs and divots is to put all those tiles on their own layer and have the entire layer be a collision layer for the player. The issue here is that the inner areas of the cliffs and divots were also blocks on the same layer as the collision layer. You might think, well, just move those inner areas to the ground layer or something, and that would work to not make them collide. That's true, however I still need those specific blocks to exist on the collision layer because those blocks make up part of the cliffs and divots. Basically if I were to take all of the inside areas and put them on a non-collision layer, the game engine would no longer see those inner areas as cliffs or divots. Meaning it can't tell if the player is walking on cliff blocks or divot blocks anymore. And it also means auto tiling for cliffs and divots wouldn't work properly as it wouldn't see fully complete cliffs and divots and instead see these weird ring shapes. So the solution for this was to dig into the code that handles drawing out the collision mesh when terrain loads in, and simply check each block to determine if it was a specific inner cliff or divot block. If it was, then we can just ignore that in the collision mesh construction. Very simple solution, which allows the game to properly allow these blocks to be traversable, but also still treat these blocks as cliff or divot blocks. Now onto the auto tiling that I briefly mentioned earlier. Initially I was actually hand placing down the cliff and divot blocks and simply loading in my custom islands for the players to explore. However, I wanted a fully procedural island generation, so I needed to create auto tiling or rule tiles for cliffs and divots. The way rule tiles work is that you just create some code that checks surrounding tiles and by using that information you can specify which tile image to display in any given tile. Now I know Unity has a built-in rule tile system for its tile map component, however I opted out of using tile map simply because I discovered it has limitations when it comes to loading large tile maps and modifying them in real time. The system I'm using is custom, but works in a way sort of similar to tile map. The major difference is that I have to go in and manually designate a lot of things like checking surrounding tiles. So how I do the auto tiling in Cloudscape is when I'm generating the train, it loops through every block in the entire grid. On each block, I have a bunch of booleans that check a bunch of the surrounding tiles. For example, x minus 1 and y plus 1 is the block to the upper left of the current block in the grid. With these booleans, I can create some conditions which are just comparing a bunch of booleans to get a rule for a particular type of block. So for example, if there are blocks completely surrounding a block, that current block could be an inner cliff block. If there are blocks on all sides of a particular block except for its left side, then that block is most likely a left edge cliff block. If I were trying to create simple box shapes, this would only take a handful of rules to get all of the different blocks needed. However, the cliffs in Cloudscape are a bit odd, because while the top portion of the cliff is basically some form of simple closed box shape, the cliff also has a bottom wall that is two blocks tall. This means I need a whole lot more rules determining exactly what image any particular block should display. As you can see in this image, I ran into all sorts of interesting issues where I needed to basically go in and figure out specific rules for very specific block layouts, so I could get the proper block to display in all of these scenarios. Every time I would make a bunch of new rules and generate cliffs, I'd find new blocks that needed new rules. I'm happy to say that after several days of work, I think I've covered about 95% of all possible combinations. I'm sure I've missed one or two, but I can squash those when I come across them. The cliffs were only half of the problem, I still needed to also create rules for divots. Divots are a bit different than cliffs, as they aren't as tall, but also don't have any walls on the bottom edges, so I needed to create entirely different rules for divots. So again, I spent a day or so just writing out all of the rules inside of conditions so that the proper images displayed for each block. I then needed to update my raise and lower terrain tools that I use in the game to automatically generate cliffs and divots in real time. This was slightly easier because now that I've created all of these rules, the way to add cliffs and divots was simply to fill the drawing area with either cliff or divot tiles and let the auto tile properly correct all of the surrounding blocks to update the terrain. Finally, I created a new tool called Flatten Terrain, which does exactly what it says and flattens out cliffs and divots. This tool actually creates all sorts of problems because the moment blocks are removed, it can create really weird issues. For example, because the Flatten tool is a 2x2 two two block, 
If you were to try and flatten a 2x4 cliff at the bottom two blocks, it would leave a 2x3 cliff that was broken. So I needed to make sure it could remove the entire cliff in that situation, along with many other scenarios. The end result is this fun and fast terraforming in the game, which lets me quickly create interesting cliff and divot shapes and also carve through them easily. There's still some work left to do with cliffs and divots. I'd like to add natural ramps to both so that the players can freely move around on them. Right now you can fill a divot with water to create lakes and rivers, but I'd also like this to work properly on top of cliffs so that it could be possible to create waterfalls. There's also some minor issues with the flatten tool where it still messes up some tiles, but I'll get around to fixing those as well. Moving on to the swaying grass and plants. Initially, I added a pretty simple script to my game which allows grass, plants, and other objects to react to the player and to wind in the game. Wind is basically just an integer that can be positive or negative. If it's positive, it blows left to right, and if it's negative, it blows right to left. The larger the value of the integer, the stronger the wind. I can use this integer value in any sort of functions to have objects be impacted by wind. So I set up these objects to have a function which would rotate the object at its pivot point and sort of rock it back and forth. This worked okay, but wasn't really what I was looking for. Having the grass rock back and forth like this meant that the bottom edge of the grass image was rotating when it really it wouldn't actually move from the ground. What I really needed was a way to skew the sprites so that only the top vertices were affected. I quickly learned early on that Unity doesn't really have a way to do this via normal code. The only way to really achieve this sort of vertex manipulation was to use a shader. Unfortunately, I have very limited knowledge when it comes to making shaders in Unity. The language it uses is quite different from C-sharp, however, I managed to find a very simple example of creating a sine wave to basically skew a mesh and have it wobble back and forth. From that example, I heavily modified it to play nicely with my wind, and the end result was the effect shown here. You might notice that there's actually a bit of rotation still on the sprites, but I included it simply because I felt it added a bit more visual of the object bending instead of purely skewing the object. An interesting thing to note here is I've also played around with changing the Y position of the vertices based on how much the sprite is bending. This makes it not be such a hard skew compared to just moving the topmost vertices on the X axis only. One last thing I'm still working out is allowing the player and other objects to push these objects to one side as they interact. This works pretty great for the stationary objects, but it's a bit fickle when an object already has wind being applied to it. So there's still a little bit of work left to do there, but I'm pretty happy with the result so far. The trees in this footage aren't actually using the shader and are still using the old rotation method, which is why they don't look as good. I plan to overhaul the tree objects entirely, so when I get around to doing that, the treetops will get a much needed shader improvement. That pretty much wraps it up for this devlog. I've currently put a pin in the terrain stuff and the shader stuff, and I've moved on to working on the bug catching system. The next devlog will focus primarily on that, and I'll get into details about how I create new sprites for animation, how I add new items and objects into my game, and how I'm going about implementing the whole bug catching system in general. If you enjoyed this video, consider leaving a like and subscribing to the channel. Your positive feedback and support helps me out immensely. Also feel free to follow me on Twitter or hop on the Cloudscape Discord and chat with me and the community. Links are in the video description. As always, thanks for watching.